Abe Greenberg and his wife run a tailor shop. He says he's been a tailor for 55 years. He learned his trade when he was 11 years old in Poland back in 1919. In 1939, when the Nazis took over Poland, Abe was forced to work for them. Years ago, before my dad passed away, and he told me, promised me that these stories won't die, that you'll keep my stories alive. And then your dad and, and what he's doing and how important it is to Bill Pollard to keep these stories alive. We've made a promise to our fathers to do this. Yep. There needs to be more told. I talked to too many young people from high school, middle school, and you talk something about the Holocaust, they don't know anything about it. Welcome to the Missouri Veterans Home, Cameron, and we are so honored to have you all here with us. But today we're here for a very special event. It's the dedication of our military library. We're the only veterans home in the country to have a dedicated military library. I asked Mr. Pollard how old he was, and he said, I'm 95. But if I make it on April 13th, I'll be 96. He also decided that he wanted to talk to you all and say a few words, so I'm going to let him do that just right now. I uh, must tell you I'm moved. I have some people that showed up today that have been con we've contacted before. I haven't seen them in years. Gene Greenberg and my son, Larry Pollard, started in grade school together. We were neighbors of the Greenberg family. Guys like Bill and the rest of you here, uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. If the war went on one day longer, Stan and I might not be here, but you GIs, you men that fought, we owe everything. We moved a lot when I was a kid, and this was another move. In fact, it was my last day of third grade. We moved into a neighborhood, uh, 60th and Oak. And of course, I was used to all these moves, jumped on my bike, took off, and started riding around trying to find somebody my age. And I went around the block a couple of times and Gene was out in the front yard of his house. And he stopped me on my second trip around, wanted to know if I wanted to play some football. All right, buddy, here's where it started. I know. Looks smaller. I know, it does. It does. Particularly when we'd run football routes. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> we, didn't have a lot of room to run a curl pattern. Yeah, it was, the goal line was that car or yeah, that car. Yeah, you go to the fender by that yeah, car and I'm gonna yeah. hit you. We found we had so many things in common. I mean, things we liked, you know, yeah. like the, right. the baseball. We spent more time at Larry's house than my house. And, and where my parents had that accent and talked kind of funny and, you know, and, and all that, I kind of felt when I, when I went into Larry's house, I was Moving into the Donna Reed show, I can't believe it, 61 years ago. We, yeah. We met right here. On this tree, isn't it the one you planted? It is, it is. We planted After that Dutch next Elm. to our house and then yeah. moved it out here. Do you remember throwing a baseball against those steps? Yeah. Oh, the yeah. clubhouse. <laughs> the garage in the clubhouse. Yeah. <laughs> and there's your house. Yep. Summer wasn't over yet. I mean, it was getting close to we were going to be starting fourth grade. And, uh, but I just, I don't know, curiosity or whatever, and I just 
said to Gene, you know, or asked him, I said, you know, why, why, do your, why does your dad have numbers tattooed on his arm? And we were at your house. Right. And uh, he started to tell me the story of the Holocaust, which I really knew nothing about. And uh, he disappeared into, I assume, your mom and dad's room, but brought out pictures of Samuel and Simon and told me all about them and told me, and I, I just, you know, I couldn't believe this kind of stuff really happened, you know? And of course, I knew my dad had been in the war and also been back to Korea, but, you know, he never really talked about anything like that before, so... Um, Excuse me. The story of the Holocaust that you told me. Never forgot it. In November 1939, when the German Nazis, they marched in to Poland, Lodz, and our hometown. The Nazis came into Lodz. And I think uh, my dad tells stories of roundups and some of the very degrading harassments that the Nazis put the Jews through. You know, treat the Jews however you want. They come in with horses, and the horses make dirty the street and the Jewish people has to go out and clean up the street with the hand, not with the broom. There was about 1,500 people, Jewish people, and they make them to march around, around the big field there, and they've been marching around their common from one to 10. Every 10 has to be shot. The Germans forced Lodge's Jewish population into the ghetto, and it was a 1.6 square mile area in the slum part of town. And um, they forced 165,000 people into that 1.6 square miles. We had the other to go in, in the ghetto. We marched in, in the ghetto, all with our packs, but we had it. And the, all the make all the student from the Jewish people, he was like the king. They make him the king of the Jew. And he was leading us, like he was the leader. Whatever he said, we have to do him. And they started to make him Jewish money with the David star on the money. And his name was a money. Dad was fortunate in a way because he was a, a tailor and a very skilled tailor. And um, he had a pretty good sized tailor shop in Lodge before, before the war. In this tailor shop, all of those people that have been working for me before the war, I have to bring them in, in that shop. We finished all of this material, what we had left over. And then it was a little bit quiet, but we have worked in the ghetto, but we have get it, we don't get no money, no pay. The large ghetto became one of the largest suppliers of Nazi goods, uniforms, boots, coats, clothing for the uh, German civilians and officers' wives and all that were all manufactured in the Lodge ghetto. When Dad had his uh, tailor shop and he was working for the Germans, he was running this place, uh, there were people from other parts of Poland and other parts of Europe that were taken, Jews, to taken to the, uh, to the camps, and they were stripped. And their clothes were sent back to, uh, to Lodge and they'd be sewn up and fixed to, to give out or to, to do something else with. 
Well, before, and I don't recall if it was uh, our niece or a nephew or who the relation was, uh, before they were supposed to go on a transport, dad sewed some money, some zlotys, which were uh, Polish money, uh, into the lining, I think, of uh, the coat that this person would be traveling with. And then some months later, they had clothes come in that they had to remake or redo, and he found the coat with the money still sewn into the lining. The ghetto was totally liquidated at the end of August of 1944. On the third floor, we look out to the window, we saw the Germans marching, and the, the king of the Jews, his police, with the Germans all together, they marched down right there in our block there, and the first thing they blockade down our uh, apartment, uh, department store. I mean, uh, the, the, the our, our apartment building. I'm sorry, our apartment building, they occupied. And they're coming around house to house, uh, door to door. People been hiding places. And they kicked them out from all over and they brought them out from the houses. And they, they shipped us out to Auschwitz. They probably boarded the train August 12th or August 13th. And even though the train ride should have taken a, less than a day, uh, the train from Lodge to Auschwitz could take two days or more. We come with the, to Auschwitz, we left We've been traveling around from our hometown lodge, Poland. From our hometown, we trying to, they shipped us out from there to Auschwitz, which normally takes a trip up the, I would say about the 100 miles. It's all together from lodge to, the, to Auschwitz. But they dragged us around Two nights and two days, they've been dragging us around, and they didn't. The, the train been stopping and going and stopping and go like this, and there was very awful bad. And one of the stories that Dad told it was, it was very hot. You can imagine all these people crammed in. Uh, if people died, there was not even enough room for them to fall. They were just held up by, by the crush of the crowd, and. Um, it must have rained while they were uh, in transport because I remember our dad telling me that uh, uh, they didn't stop and get fed or, or passed around bottles of water. Uh, it was raining, so my dad had to hold the boys up towards the ceiling to get whatever raindrops came through cracks in the roof of the car to, uh, to get any water into his two boys. After we come to Auschwitz, this, those Nazis, all officers, like the Eichmanns, like the, all of the big stars, they've been staying there. Our parents had been in this boxcar now for a couple days, and they arrived at Auschwitz II, or Birkenau, which was the death camp, and where all the trains went and unloaded. They arrived at night, and after two days in, in total darkness, the door swung open, and these large spotlights, just, just bright as can be inside of these carts, blinding the people. And the Germans were screaming at them. They were screaming in German. They were going, a rouse, a rouse, schnell, a rouse which is out, out, quickly, get out. And they had German shepherds at their, you know, stretching the leashes, just barking and barking at these people. The little cows come the trains, and they ordered all men separate, and women separate, and children separate. But my two boys, they were a little bit 
uh, they've been uh, the oldest one was that time oh. 1944 he was 14 years old and the younger one was about 12 years old. And we thought the boys they go and go with me and my wife she's been going on the other side with the, with the woman able-bodied men into older people into women and children and no one knew what these groups were but they just knew they were getting selected into different groups my dad was in the group with the men but he had held on to his two sons he kept them close to him he wanted didn't want to lose them in all this mass confusion and they were in line with the men the two boys were small for their age so they didn't look older and they didn't look like they might fit with the men and one of the nazis came over and wanted to know why these boys were in the men's line they took out the boys from me and they sent them on the other side and i didn't know where they got where they're going i asked this uh, officer high officer He'd been staying there with a whip, and I've been asking him, I said, the officer, this boy, he's been doing, he's a good operator, he's been working with us in the tailor shop, he's a very hard worker, can you leave him with us, with me, he will work with me together, we don't know what I'm going to do. They took the whip and they hit me over my shoulder, my back. So my oldest son, he said, Daddy, you go. We get along a lot, don't worry about us. And he took his younger brother by the hand, and they went there. Next morning, I get up. In the morning, I go out from the barracks, go close to the barbed wires, and look on the other side, and there was a, a man standing by the barbed wires and looking same like I've been looking. And I asked him, uh, how long you're here? He said, he told me he is there about a couple of weeks already. I said, you know, uh, I have my two boys. Where's the children? Because they said the children, but they took up the young kids. They take it to work there. Where are they? This man said to me, why are you asking? And I said, I got two boys. And I wanted to know, they took him away, they sent him on the other side. And he said, if you got two boys, and they sent him on the other side. He said, look, I saw, he showed to me the building there. Look, do you see the chimney there? The smoking? They had the smoke from your boys. They're all burned, all gassed and burned. You don't have to worry about them anymore. After they select me, they tattooed on my arm and they they send me out whole group on a truck. They delivered us in Auschwitz. They about the they about the six seven miles from Auschwitz. There's the coal mine. And they send us out to the coal mine. And I've been working in this coal mine. I've been working for seven months. I've been going in the coal mine. It was awful, very awful hard for us. I've been going there, and every day we we see like we are dead. Every day, every day I've been, I've been three times. I've been uh, like, uh, like to go to to death in the gas cabin because uh, I was injured in the coal mine a couple of times. I was uh, sick and. Uh, but I got, um, I was lucky. We come out from the coal mine, we come home in the bag. We have an order to go in in the bag and take all of the the blankets. We had blankets on the on the bed. Uh, all, you, you, everybody has to take the blanket and we're gonna march. We've been marching now, there was snowing, ice on the, uh, on the highway. We've been watching three days and three nights. We've been watching the 
there was been going on shooting on the highway between the wood. They've been shooting. I don't know. Must be from the Russian was on the one side and the Nazis was on the other side. They've been shooting, but then they've been uh, shooting there. We have to lay down on the highway on the ice, snow, and we have got not much clothes on, very light clothes. It was very, very hard to march until we got out on this death march. On this death march has been killed a half from the 5,000, was killed a half of them on all the way. They've been shooting and shooting. Somebody bent down to pick up a, a little snow to stop the, the thirst, it's thirsty. Why he bent down, they shot him. This is the way it's been going on. Someone has been, is not going to walk right, they shot him. And this is the way it's been going on until we got it in a place, a place called Blechame, across Poland. And we got in there, and there was a uh, gathered, uh, but uh, more over 20,000 people in this camp. Then they gave an order, everybody who wants to go out, get a bread and a salami, and we're going to march out from here. But I feel like I cannot go. I was almost dead. My foot, feet were swollen up, and I couldn't go. I couldn't walk. I've been laying on this, on this bed there, and I couldn't go out. So those people, they went with them. We heard at night, middle of the night, we heard the shooting in the wood. All those people, they've been all killed out. If I would go, I would be the same among those people. And there was a hard time until I find my wife, luckily, after the war has still been going on. There was in, uh, in February, February 1945, we got out from there. One of the, the biggest strokes of luck, and it wasn't 100% luck, I suppose, that they bo bo both of our parents survived. And after the war was over and they were liberated, my father, our father, made it back to Lodge because that's what you do. You go home to find out who else is coming home. And uh, he found the building that was in ruins that they lived in. He, going through the rubble, he found a few photographs and things like that that had been in their possession, nothing of any value. That had been stripped long ago. And he was walking on the street, and he heard his name called. And uh, it was a woman. He did not recognize her. She was emaciated. She had no hair. And uh, she called his name, and, and it turned out he knew her. And uh, her question was, why are you not with Chaya? Why are you not with Helen? What do you mean? Uh, Helen is probably dead. No, I saw her. She's in uh, a displaced persons camp in Germany. Dad was shocked and surprised. He'd seen so much death all around him. And somehow or other, he made it uh, back. He made it to uh, Zaltzheim in Frankfurt. Uh, he made it there. Uh, I think that uh, survivors could travel on the trains uh, at free. And uh, who knows? He walked, he rode. One way or another, he got there. When he got there, he found out which barracks our mother was in, and he made his way to that barracks. And he walked in, and there were some women there, and he said, where's, where's my wife? Where's Chaya Greenberg? And they said, well, she was here, but she had to go somewhere else. She'll be back in a little while. Why don't you wait? And Dad was not about waiting. He wanted to run out and go find her. So he left, and while he's out looking, mom came back. And the women were very excited. They said, your husband is alive. And she was obviously excited. 
And she, like Dad, wanted to run out of the building and go find him. Well, according to my mother, uh, the women, the other women in the barracks who were there sat on her, would not leave, let her leave. Uh, they had all lost so much that if they could be eyewitness to a reunion of a husband and wife, they weren't letting her go. Dad came back and they were reunited, which was quite, quite amazing. I was in Italy, I was in France, I was in Germany, I was in, uh, for a brief time, I was in uh, Scotland for some training. Lost some men, we lost some men. Even in air evacuation, we lost some men. As the war was winding down, and uh, our army started liberating the, what we call them, what the common knowledge was, concentration camps. They weren't concentration camps. They were murder camps. Their main job was kill as many people that they thought didn't live up to Hitler's standards. It was miserable. Miserable. Humanity was thrown out the window. I think every day about Mr. and Mrs. Greenberg and those two brothers. Uh, it's interesting from the standpoint of what work I've done in the library, uh, they were attracting young people. I'm not, a, I'm not a teacher. I don't pretend to be a teacher. Started coming here and they found out that I was working on the library. But one class would tell the other, C. Pollard, he yelled. They immediately put those two sons to death. And they also, at the same time, the father and mother was separated, sent different directions. I had no idea the kind of work that Bill Pollard, along with the people here at the Missouri Veterans Home, had done to make this happen and to do what he does and to know that kids from Missouri Western University in St. Joseph and kids from Princeton, Missouri and kids from other places in, in this area come to this library and they come into this room and they sit there and Bill Pollard, a hero and a veteran, tells them our parents' story. No words. There are no words to describe the love and respect and admiration and thanks that we have for Bill Pollard. The young people need to know what is happening. I'm not being an old maid or an old man when I tell you, but it could happen again. Will not replace us! Jews will not replace us!